Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to take your seats. Before we begin, may I request that all mobile phones and beeping devices be turned off or switched to the silent mode. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Andrew Keane. <clears throat> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all. Welcome to the Singapore Management University and to the first SMU Presidential Distinguished Lecturer for 2018. Thank you for joining us today. And of course, a very warm welcome to our speaker. Andrew Keane is among the world's best known contemporary analysts of digital business and culture and commentators on the digital revolution. He is the author of four books, The Cult of the Amateur, Digital Vertigo, The Internet is Not the Answer, and his latest international hit, How to Fix the Future. Thank you, Mr. Keane for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us here today. I would now like to invite Professor Arnold DeMeyer, President of SMU, up on stage to introduce our speaker. Professor DeMeyer, please. Ladies and gentlemen, students, colleagues, and uh, members of the SMU community, a very good afternoon and welcome to the fourth lecture of the SMU Presidential Distinguished Lecture Series in this academic year. He was mentioning it was the first of this year. I will think in academic years is a good academic, right? Andrew, uh, first of all, please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Ms. Andrew Keane. Uh, Andrew enjoyed a sort of global multidisciplinary education that we always talk about when we talk about SMU. He was awarded a first class degree in history from the London University, was a British scholar at the University of Sarajevo in the former Yugoslavia, and earned a master's degree in political science from the University of California at Berkeley. He is now very well known as an analyst and commentator on the digital revolution and its impact on the 21st century business, education, and society. He has lectured, as was also mentioned, at major international conferences and universities around, around the world, including Warsaw, Amsterdam, Stanford, Berkeley, and Oxford. I see that Cambridge is missing from this uh, <clears throat> list. Uh, you know I have a certain preference for Cambridge. Um, Andrew was actually among the, the earliest to write about the dangers that the internet poses to our culture and society. His first book that was already mentioned uh, by our MC, The Cult of the Amateur, was critical in helping and advance the conversation around the internet uh, that has morphed in, from a tool providing efficiency and opportunities for consumers and business to an elemental force that is profoundly reshaping our societies and our world. UK's The Guardian newspaper described it as a lacerating critique of the obsession with user-generated content which characterized the early days of Web 2.0. The newspaper said that whenever conference organizers wanted to stir up controversy, actually they wrote a bloody good row, uh, Andrew Keane was the man uh, they invited to give the keynote address. <clears throat> so you know what you're looking forward to, right? A bloody good row. Now in his fourth and la latest book, How to Fix the Future, he looks to the past and around the world to learn how we might best shape our digital future. Uh, he describes how societies tamed the excesses of the industrial, industrial revolution, which, like, like its digital counterpart, demolished long-standing models of living, ruined harmonious environments, and altered the business world beyond recognition. Traveling the world to interview experts in a wide variety of fields from EU Commissioner for Competition, Margaret Vestager, who was on this uh, stage a few months ago, whose recent $2.4 billion fine to Google made headlines around the world, to interviewing successful venture capitalists who nonetheless see the tide turning, to CEOs of companies including the New York Times, he unearthed, it, unearthed approaches to tackling our digital future. Uh, and actually, when you sort of read the press today about what Facebook is facing, uh, and uh, uh, what, what, what is it, uh, Cambridge Analytica is uh, doing in a very legal way, 
uh, it's interesting to hear what his comments might be on this, these events. But he identified five key tools, regulation, competitive innovation, civic responsibility, consumer choice, and education. And he may take examples from Estonia, India, Germany, and of course also Singapore as models for fixing these problems and how these tools are being put into practice around the globe. Um, I'm looking forward to hear what he has to say to us. I'm not going to go further because what I read uh, sort of diagonally in the book, uh, I know that our traditional format is that you will talk for about 30, maximum 40 minutes, and otherwise I will give you this sign, right? Um, and uh, uh, then we will have a Q&A, an open Q&A here in this room for another 40 minutes. Uh, thank you all for coming. I look forward to an enlightening lecture and a good evening of discussion, and please join me in welcoming Mr. Andrew Keane to the stage. my tea here since I'm originally English. I can't give a lecture without a cup of tea. Uh, thank you so much for that very generous introduction. The one thing that you missed um, is that I'm also a, an entrepreneur. In fact, most of my life has been spent as an entrepreneur, uh, mostly a failed entrepreneur. Of course, most entrepreneurs have failed, and certainly in Silicon Valley, the the myth is that you fail up, and all the things I've done seem to be failures, which has resulted in me being here. So being an entrepreneur, though, I think does um, bring something else in terms of my uh, approach and understanding of the digital revolution. I'm, just not, I'm not just a theorist, a journalist, an analyst. I'm actually someone who participated. I founded a company in the mid-90s called Audio Cafe, which was a music startup, um, which was very exciting at the time, um, and was a typical kind of web 1.0 startup. So it's worth noting that as well. And I think in terms of, and, I, and we, were talk, we were talking earlier about the, the university here, I think it is important um, in terms of making sense of the world as we, as we move forward, and certainly in terms of education models for uh, fixing the future and preparing people for a very dramatically different new world, a digital world. I think the kind of eclecticism I have is actually of value. Uh, mine was kind of cobbled together. It was slightly accidental and arbitrary and sometimes rather painful. But I think it is a model that's important. And so whilst getting good degrees from traditional universities and working for large firms has some value, the future of the world lies in that kind of eclecticism. So I've uh, written, i just come out with a new book called How to Fix Future. Now, of course, implicit in that title is, well, what's wrong with the future? Is it broken? And I think uh, I've spent the last 10 years since 2007 arguing that the future, i.e. the thing we look forward to, is extremely problematic, it's flawed. It offers a lot of promise, but in actuality, um, it's failing in many respects. And of course, the news today, I just did a TV interview around Facebook. The news today around Facebook is particularly pertinent. The, uh, the lady who interviewed me on television said, well, this isn't a data breach, so what's, so what's really going on here? And I said, well, it's business as usual. Uh, what's happening with Cambridge Analytica and more and more revelations about the way in which Facebook was used um, to actually corrupt the political process and shift the election to Trump in America, used by people like Steve Bannon. It was entirely legal and reflects their business model of turning us all into products. Um, so uh, it's, it's really important that there's more and more news about these kinds of things. And I've been worrying about this for, 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 as I said, for about 10 years, since 2007 when I wrote Cult of the Amateur. Before that, as I suggested, I was an entrepreneur, and I still remain an entrepreneur. I do a lot of different investing and startups. I'm involved in a number of different event uh, organizations in, in Silicon Valley. So I don't want to claim that I've completely fled the, uh, the innovation space. So 
the future's broken. What does that mean? I think it, what it means is when in 1995, in the mid-90s, when the first generation of web innovators of entrepreneurs like myself, when we, when we founded companies, when we imagined the future, we were incredibly excited. We were incredibly optimistic. Now, of course, we were entrepreneurs, so we wanted to, first and foremost, we wanted to be rich. Uh, any entrepreneur who tells you that they want to improve the world and not worrying about their financial compensation are lying. But at the same time, we were very, very excited about what was happening. We thought that this digital revolution, the beginning of the internet, 1995, some of you are old enough to remember what it was like back then. This was when there wasn't even broadband. This is when you had dial-up, when there was no, when Amazon was just a tiny little startup. This was pre-Google, pre-Facebook, pre-Instagram. This was when the internet was just getting started. We thought that this was gonna be a revolution that would change everything. We thought that it would empower the edge, empower everyone, create a new kind of uh, innovative egalitarianism where any, entrep any entrepreneur could come and start companies and create a kind of new level playing field in economics. We thought it would create remarkable amount of jobs. We thought that um, it would be liberating and empowering for culture. We thought that the old elites of the dominant newspaper industry, the uh, the movie studios, the record labels, we thought they were kind of corrupt, they were archaic, they didn't get it, and we thought that we were liberating the creative juices of society, that this technology would allow everyone to become artists and creators and writers. And we thought that we were reinventing business too, that we were coming up with models that were different. And indeed, Google, of course, articulated this most clearly in 2001 when it came up with its don't be evil phrase. The idea that you could be good and successful at the same time, that these were new kind of companies, whether it was Facebook or Google, that they, for example, when they IPO, they did it differently. They didn't do it like the old companies. So much promise, so much hope, so much revolutionary fervor now, of course, we know that throughout history, there's always been great fervor around revolutions. In political terms, it may have been the French or the Russian or the Chinese revolutions. There's always been huge excitement, a kind of utopianism, a belief that history was starting again, that everything is possible. So in the mid-90s, we all believed that. That's why we flocked to San Francisco. That's why we embraced startups. That's why we worked 18-hour days and slept on the floors and invested all our resources. Most of us, like myself, actually didn't make large fortunes, but we had the experience which has benefited us in the long run. 20 or 25 years later, though, I think the, the result is, at best, disappointing. We were promised more equality. We were promised that, to, to, to borrow a phrase from old Chairman Mao, that many thousands of entrepreneurs would bloom, that this would enable many, many startups, that it would create a new kind of vibrancy in economic terms. But of course, what's happened, unfortunately, and this is nobody's fault, this is a consequence of the structural nature of the digital economy, is that we have increasingly a winner-take-all economy. A tiny group of dominant companies, the five largest companies in the world, the five most highly capitalized companies in the world are all West Coast tech companies. Facebook, Google, and Apple in the Bay Area, and Apple, uh, and uh, sorry, and Amazon, uh, and Microsoft in Seattle. Those are the, the wealthiest companies in the world, the most highly capitalized, the most successful, the most powerful. We have a huge, a remarkable concentration of economic power in the Bay Area in particular. The nine wealthiest multi-billionaires in Silicon Valley are collectively worth about the same amount as the two, uh, as, the, as, as the poorest two billion people on Earth. In other words, nine people have the collective wealth of nine billion other people on the planet. 
we have a situation where it's harder and harder to compete against these dominant players. That there are, there is no Hertz, Avis, uh, Dicotta, the, the, the two market or two man race in in, um, in 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 any of these markets. Amazon dominate e-commerce. Uh, uh, Google dominates search. Facebook dominates social. So we have absolute winners, increasing inequality. And I think this reflects an increasing carving out, a hollowing out of the middle, of the middle class, of middle incomes, of middle influence. Now, I don't think it would be fair to blame all our inequality in the West on the digital revolution, but it's certainly playing a role. So I think, firstly, the future is broken because we thought we were getting more equality with this digital revolution. But actually, we've got more inequality. We also thought we were going to get more jobs. We thought that this would result in an, an enrichment of opportunity, of jobs, of creativity. Now, of course, everyone's free to put their work up on Instagram as photographers, to put their music and their movies up on YouTube, and it has created some wealth. There is no doubt that there have many, many jobs have indeed been created out of the technological revolution. But as I show in my last book, well, the internet is not the answer. Actually, jobs are not being created. They're being destroyed in this latest round of technological innovation. When Instagram, for example, was acquired by Facebook a few years ago for one and a half billion dollars, it employed 15 people. And at that very moment, when Facebook was acquiring Instagram for all that money, Kodak, the previous generation f photography company, which had employed 30,000 people, was going bankrupt. Jobs are not being created. Now, of course, the Googles and the Facebooks of the world do employ people. But for their worth, for their value, these companies are not creating jobs. And of course, on the horizon in particular, on the horizon is the great challenge, the great crisis of joblessness created by smart technology, whether it's self-driving cars that will take away the jobs of many, many drivers around the world, whether it's the algorithms that will replace surgeons and engineers and lawyers, whether it's the robots in fast food restaurants that will replace fast food workers. The reality is, and most economists acknowledge this, the reality is, is that we do indeed on, in the long, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the middle term, I would say, not necessarily near term, but near the long term, we are faced with a massive job crisis through automation, through smart technology. So inequality in jobs, in both in those terms, the future is broken. Thirdly, I think we have a cultural crisis. It's increasingly self-evident. We were promised that all this technology would enrich our culture, would enable people to speak um, in a more civil, creative, constructive way with one another. Now, of course, much of this technology is used responsibly. I'm not claiming that everyone who goes on the networks behave like a barbarian, behave in a particularly uncivil way. But what seems to have transpired out of this user-generated social media revolution, when we do away with the curator, when we do away with the gatekeeper, is increasing incivility, hatred, echo chamber culture. We're talking to ourselves. We're certainly not talking to others. And of course, it's perhaps no coincidence in America we have the first Twitter president, Trump, who's, who, who, who can be summarized in, a, in one word, narcissism. He's a man so self-obsessed that he knows and notices and understands nothing else around him except himself. The entire universe, in his mind at least, revolves around him. Now, I'm not saying that everyone on social media is Donald Trump, but certainly the narcissistic, self-obsessed um, uh, nature of this culture is generating a cultural crisis. It's also creating more and more technological addiction. 
Now everybody here knows, particularly parents, how addictive these new devices and technologies and algorithms are. Above all else, of course, it's created a crisis of democracy, a crisis of truth. No one knows what to believe anymore because partially uh, organized trolls, often financed from Moscow, are putting out untruth. Because we've done away with the gatekeeper, because we've done away with traditional editors in many respects, on open networks like Twitter and Facebook, nothing is to be believed. So I think the cultural crisis is self-evident. Uh, it doesn't mean that everything in our culture is in crisis, but it does mean that truth itself is increasingly becoming a victim. And indeed, democracy, and I think there's no doubt that the rise of authoritarianism, whether it's in Turkey or in the United States or in Eastern Europe, it's bound up in people's loss of faith in truth and in knowing what to trust. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, particularly in terms of today's news, the future is broken because the dominant business model of Silicon Valley doesn't work. It was based on free. I was at Audio Cafe, as I said, in the startup in the 90s. We all thought we could give away our products for free and sell advertising on the back end. It was a flawed model. Now, it worked for some people. It worked for Google and Facebook. But the problem with these models is that they reflect what people call, what I call in my book, surveillance capitalism. We've been turned into the products. Every time we use these services, we're being watched. That's the nature of this business model. We get the stuff for free, and these companies are advertising Goliaths. And the reason why they're so profitable and why they dominate advertising so much is because they know so much about us, which adds to the success of their business model. So it's not surprising that we have endless scandals now about Google, and particularly about Facebook. It's not because anyone's done anything wrong at Facebook. It's just that the business models don't work. They are surveillance capitalist models. And the very essence of that lies in being watched. Surveillance then undermines our privacy. And undermining our privacy also undermines who we are as individuals. So what to do about it? How do we fix this stuff? Now, it's not easy. I'm not going to promise you an app for fixing the future. I think it's important to remind ourselves that this is a, a historic challenge. In some ways, we're back in 1850. Now, of course, in 1850, uh, in Singapore, there wasn't a lot going on. But uh, in, in Western Europe, there was the Industrial Revolution, factories, tremendous technological innovation, disruption, excitement, inequality, unemployment, cultural crisis, all the same things that I've been describing today. And it took 50 or 100 years to fix a lot of this stuff. These are not cosmetic issues. These are not easy fixes. I'm not going to tell you, oh, well, all we need is blockchain, or all we need is to re-architect the internet, or all we need is for people to put their cell phones away on a Saturday and everything gets fixed. These are big issues that affect the future in a very profound way. So my book addresses this. It says, how do we fix the future? I think. If there is a meta issue in the book, it's the word agency. At times of great disruption, we feel disempowered. When you have these huge forces, these massively powerful companies, when you have forces that seem beyond any of our control, we feel helpless, disempowered. We feel as if we can't do anything. So a lot of people say, well, what can I do? What can I do that Facebook's so strong? What can I do that Google's watching everything I do? What can I do that machines are going to take away my job? What can I do that schools aren't educating my kids properly for the future? What can I do that these companies seem out of control? The issue, as always in history, is of agency. Human agency is key. That's what we're good at as human beings. Throughout history, we respond to these great disruptions. We act. We shape the future in a way that reflects 
a better world. Now, I think this message is particularly important in Singapore. Whenever I come to Singapore, what is clearly manifested in this island, this remarkable story of reinvention, is agency. Uh, generation after generation over the last 50 years of people from Singapore have literally rebuilt the future, have taken command, have taken control. So I think the challenge is one of agency. And I think agency is particularly important because it's the one thing the algorithm, the smart machine, doesn't have. We've invented algorithms and smart machines that replicate us in many ways. That's its genius, that's its excitement, and that's also the dystopian nature of this technology. So we've invented machines that can drive cars. We've invented machines that can make hamburgers. We've invented machines that can clean homes. We've invented machines that can figure out illness. We've invented machines that can build bridges. But we haven't and will never invent machines that have agency, that have goals. That is quintessentially human. That's what defines us throughout history. Our use of agency in the Industrial Revolution is really important in terms of reshaping the world, in terms of labor laws and innovation and fighting pollution and fighting injustice and creating social security systems. So we need to use that agency again today. Now, I even come up with a rather, what I like to think of as a rather cute term to, to, come to, 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 to define agency. Uh, you, many of you, I'm sure, are in computer studies and you're familiar with technology. You're all familiar with Moore's Law, Gordon Moore's Law which is the law that explains the computer revolution because Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel, uh, in 1965 observed that every 18 months computer chips would double in power. That's why I can carry around what in 1965 would have been a supercomputer, large enough to have been in this room. Today, we all have one of these things. Tomorrow, they'll probably be knitted into our hand or our eye or our brain. Eventually, they'll be invisible. I come up with a different kind of Moore's Law, though. I, I, I come up with a, a Moore's Law derived from Thomas More, the author of Utopia, the 16th century English book, Imagining a Better Future. In Utopia, Thomas More, the English 16th century martyr who fought against the, the King of England, uh, Henry VIII, and eventually was executed, um, argued that Agency was key. In my view, the real message of utopia is agency. So Moore's Law, M-O-R, Thomas Moore's Law, in my view, is the real thing to remind ourselves as opposed to Gordon Moore's Law, which is what most books. So when hopefully some of you will have the opportunity to read my book, chapter one is entitled Moore's Law. So how do we use our agency? It's all very well talking about agency, which may sound rather inspiring, but it's a little vague. We need, of course, to be a little bit more concrete. I spent a year traveling around the world, f seeing how people were reshaping the future. Indeed, I have a chapter on Singapore. I have a chapter on it in Estonia, and my chapters on Estonia and Singapore are about different kinds of utopias. I have a section on Germany, one on the east and the west coast of the US, something about Brussels, something about the UK, a section on India. I went everywhere and I saw ways in which human beings were using their agency to reshape the future, to make things better, to clean up the digital revolution, to fix all the problems. And I choose five, if, if you want to sort of conceptualize this, I come up with five tools that we have always had for fixing the future, which is a good way of conceptualizing how we do things. Regulation, innovation, consumer power, citizen engagement, and education. And that's how the book is organized, around those five tools, those five buckets, which define how people are doing things. So let me, uh, and I got what, about five more minutes? Let me very briefly, let me give a minute to each. I think regulation is key. I think in all great 
economic disruptions, you always need to have regulation. The problem with the Silicon Valley model is it wrote, a, it wrote regulation out. These companies are uncontrolled and in some ways uncontrollable. So one of the people I talk to in my book is Margaret Vestager, the EU Commissioner of Antitrust, the woman who fined Apple for not paying its taxes, the woman who is single-handedly taking on Google in terms of its illegal use of its search business to strengthen other parts of its business. Regulation matters. It matters because it's the only way in many ways that we can fight back against uh, these new monopolists and these new dominant powers. We see it in Germany, for example, in the way in which the German government is forcing the platforms to be more accountable, fining them when they publish lies, fining them when they publish hatred. Regulation then matters. It matters in Singapore. We had a conversation earlier. I know uh, your vice chancellor is perhaps a little less gung-ho on regulation than I am. But I think the reason why the Singapore model works is because of regulation. Now, the market is important here, but without regulation, without the responsibility of the state, indeed, the very smart nation initiative, which I write about in the book, I'm slightly ambivalent on the privacy side, but nonetheless see in very positive terms, it comes down from above. The problem with the Silicon Valley model is they thought they could do it independently from government. It was driven on radically libertarian principles which have failed in the same way as the first wave of the Industrial Revolution failed because of its failure to acknowledge the role of government. So we need more regulation. We need defense of privacy, as happening with the general data protection regulation in Europe. Regulation then matters. Innovation is also really important, but we need new kinds of innovation. In the book, I find new search engines in Germany, for example, which are building products that actually reflect and respect our privacy. We need to remember that when companies take advantage of consumers, when they don't respect their users, then they fail. I use the example of the car industry, for example. In the 1950s, the American car industry was entirely dominant. It had no rivals anywhere. They became so arrogant, they essentially began to design death traps. Traps that were so dangerous that when Ralph Nader wrote in his 1965 bestseller, uh, Unsafe at Any Speed, uh, suddenly people woke up and realized that these products were antithetical to their own interests. And they began to buy German and Japanese cars. Of course, they haven't stopped since. And ever since, the American car industry has been in decline. So consumer power matters, and innovation matters. Citizenship is, of course, really important. We need everybody to step forward. I have a, a chapter on the responsibility of Silicon Valley elites. They need to remember historical lessons. They need to learn from people like Andrew Carnegie who spent his first half of his life essentially robbing from society and the second half giving it back. Now, we already have a model with Bill Gates, but we need the new super rich of Silicon Valley and of tech, the Jeff Bezoses, for example, to step forward. Bezos is not only the richest man in the world now, but the richest man in the history of the world. He needs to become accountable. We need to use the general power law. You break it, you fix it. Bezos has been a remarkable figure in many ways in changing the nature of retail, in revolutionizing web services, and the nature of accountability in companies. But he's also, his success of Amazon has undermined jobs. So one of the things people like Amazon, some of, one of the things that people like Bezos need to do is confront the great challenges of our new age with their resources and their intelligence as citizens. There's lots of models for this. I cite them in the book. Craig Newmark, for example, the founder of Craigslist, one of the early uh, uh, sort of web, uh, web, web networks connecting buyers and sellers of advertising, which accidentally destroyed the business model of local newspapers and destroyed local newspapers. Newmark didn't want to do that. It was accidental. It was an unintended consequence. Having woken up to it, 
uh, Newmarket spent the second half of his life, after the success of Craigslist, trying to reinvent local journalism. Finally, last but not least, is education. I have a section in which, indeed, in, in Singapore, I think Singapore is an interesting model of a country that is really trying to reinvent education for our digital age, trying to get people to rethink what it means to be human in the digital age. I have sections on new models for thinking about education. I have a section, for example, on Waldorf education that discourages the use of technology in the classroom and focuses on encouraging children to have agency. Agency matters. And that's, I think, where education is so key. We need to train our children, not in things, not in knowledge. In the old industrial age, we could fill them with information about the law or medicine or engineering, and that was enough. Today, of course, that information is fairly useless. It's useless because you can access it on Google. It's useless because the algorithm is replacing us. What isn't useless, though, is what humans can do. An algorithm might be able to determine whether or not someone's sick, but an algorithm can't sit down with a patient and talk to them. An algorithm can't be empathetic. An algorithm can't give this kind of speech. An algorithm can't be creative. So, and an algorithm, above all else, doesn't have agency. An algorithm can't think for itself. It can't be conscious. So at an age, in the digital age, where we as humans, our natures, our purpose, our goals, our value, more than anything else, is coming under question, is being challenged. We need to double down on what it means to be human. We need to double down on it, and we need to focus our education establishments in training children with agency, in giving what one Waldorf teacher in the book described to me as the development of the muscle of agency. It's an abstract notion. It's not quantifiable. It's not easy to do. It's a huge challenge, but if we're to survive the digital century, if it's not to be our last century, we need to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keane. I would now like to invite back on stage Professor Arnold DeMeyer to moderate the question and answer session. Professor DeMeyer, please. Thank you. Ladies. Ladies and gentlemen, the question and answer session is now open. Please identify yourselves and the organization that you are from <coughs> before posing your questions. I suggest those with questions may start queuing behind the microphones along the aisles. Over to you, Professor DeMeyer. Thank you very much, um, Andrew. Thanks for uh, an, uh, a number of challenges, challenging comments. Uh, of course, the, the first thing that comes up in my mind listening to you is, and sitting here in Singapore, is uh, you talk about Facebook, Google, Amazon. Of course, we are confronted with Alibaba, Tencent, uh, mm -hmm. Baidu. Uh, and it is more that it is a bit Avis Hertz because there are, in most of the cases, actually mirror images from the, the companies that you mentioned. Uh, though, sort of, I have two questions in my mind. Do you see them behaving in the same same way? Um, but the more <coughs> relevant question, perhaps, is uh, there's of course a lot more control in China um, on these companies and. It's one of your five points, that is regulation is what we need to have. Uh, should I conclude that you like the regulation as it is applied in China? Uh, well, you know the answer to that. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I think one, one of the problems uh, with, with this... Is, is the microphone working? Uh, yeah. In a book like mine, I mean, you, you say regulation is a tool, and suddenly everyone jumps on and says, all you want is regulation. It's really important to, uh, to, 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 to stress in my book that regulation is just one tool. 
and it's a tool that connects with the others. I present these five tools as a kind of stack, and the more they interact, the more they interrelate, the more value they have. Regulation in itself is certainly not the solution. We saw in terms of the industrial revolution, the, the, the great attempt to regulate everything about the industrial revolution in the Soviet experience was a catastrophe. You can't regulate innovation. Regulation that can't survive just from below, from, 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 from above. So I, I'm certainly not, I, I'm certainly not um, uh, some sort of uh, hardcore regulatory uh, activist. But I do think government matters, and I think one of the problems, particularly in the U.S., is that the government has become so dysfunctional and so paralyzed for so many different reasons that actually uh, we need more, in America we need more government, perhaps maybe in Singapore, maybe in Western Europe we need a little less, but the crisis is in America and of course these dominant tech companies in America. In terms of China, now let me be clear on China. On the one hand, I'm an, if you compare China for example with Russia, China is way more innovative. The Chinese economic miracle is, is incredible. China, Chinese tech companies are in many ways more innovative, more attractive uh, than American companies. They may indeed be the future. But there is a huge problem now in China, political terms. Because as we've had a, a shift in China towards what some people might even argue is a, is a kind of totalitarianism, certainly a, 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 a shift from a relatively open authoritarianism to something that's much more disturbing in political terms. Technology is being used in China to enforce that new political dictatorship. So we're seeing the birth in China of what I call in the book uh, digital big brother, digital Orwellianism. When Orwell wrote 1984 in 1948, he couldn't have imagined the kind of technology that it would enable political correctness and orthodoxy. That's what's happening in China. When you see the use of facial recognition technology, when you see the use in China of these schemes which are rewarding people, uh, where, where the state acquires huge amounts of data and where people are rewarded for their political correctness with housing and jobs and people are punished if they're not deeply troubled. So whilst I'm a great admirer of Chinese economic innovation, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a critic, and I'm, I'm a radical, outspoken critic of what's happening politically there. And I think uh, in, in that sense, Singapore is a really interesting model. Because Singapore, of course, isn't China. But as you all know, lots of criticism in Singapore of the sort of neo-authoritarian, neo-democratic nature of this political System. I have a chapter on Singapore in the book, which I think is quite optimistic and sympathetic to Singapore, and which actually, in some of the reviews, people have been very critical of, saying, how can this guy be sympathetic to Singapore when it's an authoritarian state? It's not clear yet what's going to happen in Singapore. But what's interesting in Singapore is the Smart Nation Initiative, in which the government collects huge amounts of data for the benefit of society. That potentially could be good for society, it could be enlightening and liberating, but potentially it could also be incredibly dangerous politically. Uh, it could become like China. So uh, Singapore is a really, in, in my view, is a really interesting laboratory of the future. In the same way as Estonia is a laboratory uh, in Europe, and what happens, I think, in Singapore and the way in which data is deployed, or this smart data, smart nation initiative is deployed by the government, well, I think have a profound bearing on many other countries in the 21st century. We don't want China to be the model for developing countries. We need alternative models, more open, more liberal models. Now, maybe Singapore will never become the liberal kind of democracy that exists in America or the UK, and some people might say that's actually good. Uh, but it can't fall into the Chinese model, which I think is catastrophic. Uh, you know, everyone talks about Russia as the danger now, and we've got to avoid Russia and Putin and the trolls. They're like mosquitoes. They can be crushed. They're annoying. The Chinese model is much more worrying uh, and much 
somewhat challenging. I think your lapel mic is hidden because. Uh, I blame the Chinese. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you should uh, figure out where it is. Has a mic. Yeah. Okay, I'm now ready to open uh, for questions from the room. Um, I see Hi. somebody there. Can you introduce yourself and uh, um, and I, so I'm forego your privacy? <laughs> Hi, I'm Jasmine and I'm from SMU. I would Hi. just like to ask you about um, the, with the advancement of technology, we are also starting to see more complex uh, cyber attack in our internet system. So a good example would be like a WannaCry ransomware attack. And I think this will be more rampant in the future. And what can we do to minimize this effect as um, individually and also <coughs> perhaps uh, nationally? What can we do to minimize this effect on cyber attack? Yeah, I mean, I'm not really an expert on security. And I, but I think you're absolutely right. I think that you know, international relations is increasingly driven by digital issues. Uh, I fear that they're, you know, we'll only really come to terms with the data revolution and the impact of big data after a data catastrophe in international political terms. We haven't had a Chernobyl yet. We haven't even had an Exxon Valdez. You know, people talk about this latest Facebook scandal as a big disaster. I mean, it's not really a disaster. It's just business as usual, as I suggested. So this is the reality we live with. I mean, we can't control it. The dark web is uncontrollable. It can't be shut down. Uh, in a way, I celebrate what I call in the book the splinter net. I mean, we're seeing the development of separate digital markets and spheres, whether it's China, Russia, Europe, the US. And as I said, I don't celebrate what's happening in China, but it's, in some ways it's not my business to, to tell the Chinese how to operate their own internet. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the solution lies in more security. <coughs> the solution lies in also more accountability. In my chapter on Estonia, which I think is one of the most important chapters in the book, I talk about a new kind of um, social contract that is existing between government and users. I don't believe that we can keep our data secret anymore. I think we live in an age of transparency, for better or worse. I don't celebrate that, but that's a reality. In Estonia, the way that this new um, social contract is being architected, uh, the government knows everything about citizens, but when it looks at our data, it tells us. So transparency and accountability and trust are key. That's a model that I think needs to be developed, perhaps also in Singapore. I see Estonia and Singapore as being quite similar. But in, coming back to your question on security, it's an impossible thing to deal with. And it's very, very hard to imagine what actually is going to come out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Mark? <coughs> Excuse me. I'm Mark Hamlet from Carnegie Mellon. So you mentioned things like uh, autonomous vehicles and the impact on job markets. And I agree with you that there are things that humans can do that algorithms will not. Empathy will be one of them. Uh, being able to be creative with the intellectual property and entrepreneurship will be uh, an example. Those are within a, a country like the United States. I think of what the future holds for what we used to call the developing world. Mm. Um, their toehold in terms of having jobs was to take over textiles and things that um, are not going to be jobs anymore for them yeah. when advanced manufacturing brings all the textile industries uh, manufacturing back into uh, the developed world. And then one final kind of footnote on this set of questions is given that you didn't talk a whole lot about the nation state, but it seems that it's not only the political system within a country like the US, but the whole political <coughs> nation state uh, order. So, uh, well, any great questions. Um, 
I mean, coming back to the nation state, I don't think it's coincidental that in the digital age where we have this so-called global village, actually the nation state's being strengthened. What we're seeing is the revitalization of the, the nation, for better or worse, the, the, re, the, the sort of the, 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 the re-romanticization of the nation state. So, you know, from Russia to Hungary to Turkey to the United States, nationalism and hostility to outsiders and hostility to immigrants and a sort of fetishization of one's culture is back in vogue. And I think it's one of the ironic consequences of the digital revolution is we were promised the global world. We were promised globalization. But McLuhan understood it. McLuhan ironically said that what we would get is a global village. And what he meant by that is we'd become villages in a global network. And that's unfortunately what we're resorting back to. In terms of your question on what happens to developing countries, it's a really interesting question. I mean, the, the, the Chinese example is interesting because, of course, the Chinese revolution was based on labor. Um, and now Foxconn is automating its, its, its factories. So where's the next China if, if, if Foxconn is automated? It's kind of interesting. Where it may exist is in curated services. So there was an interesting article recently in the New York Times about the way in which Facebook in particular is outsourcing um, its uh, editorial um, controls, uh, or sorry, YouTube is outsourcing its editorial controls, <coughs> excuse me, to many developing countries. So it's ironic that maybe where the job lies is in the need for human create, curation <coughs> and control, the very things that have destroyed the old American media companies and markets. Now, I'm not sure whether that's going to create millions or billions of jobs, I'm being optimistic here. There will be jobs. The question is what kind? Um, and, and as you say, the really interesting question is it's all very well to be empathetic and sit with a patient. It's all very well to be creative and, and, and put your stuff online. But what about villages in, in Africa? What are they going to do when everything becomes automated? Again, I don't know the answer to that. And it's one of the great questions. Of you, the you must have been thinking about that answer. Can, you, I can I push you a bit? Well, I have in a way, but uh, you know, I'm not an expert. Firstly, I'm not an expert on the developing world. Um, and secondly, um, it's always, I mean, one of the things you learn, and I try to be, you, you mentioned, I, you know, I studied history as an undergraduate, is what you learn from history is that we never quite know how these things are going to work out. And most people get the future wrong. I mean, historians are very good at pointing out the problems of trying to predict the future. Uh, and so I'm not going to sit here and tell you where I think the job's going to come from. If I knew, I probably wouldn't tell you because I'd be investing myself. <laughs> Katerina. <coughs> uh, there was an article in the FT recently about the uh, movie at the Sundance Festival, The Cleaners. That's exactly about this. Yeah, yeah, show. that was it. Yeah, it was The Cleaners. <laughs> um, if my memory serves correctly, then I think it was Garcia Marquez who said, uh, we have a public life, we have a private life, and we have a secret life and totalitarian systems drag the private life into the public. Um, now I wonder, maybe you can help us understand how Facebook got us to drag our, or to put our secret life into the public. If you can help me well, it's a great question. Uh, you know, uh, Julian Assange, I'm not necessarily a great admirer of him, but he famously said about Facebook, there's a, you know, Facebook could have been a CIA project in that, um, <laughs> We, we all reveal everything about ourselves online, so we become more and more visible. I think it's partly the, the sort of the, the, the narcissistic nature of our culture, the fact that we're supposed to celebrate self-revelation. It's partly also that we didn't quite know what we were doing. We were kind of led by everyone else. We, we stumbled in. It's like a group of people drinking in a bar. After a while, after a few beers, you forget that everyone's drunk. And I think... In 50 years, we're going to look back at this period and think, what were we doing? Were we so insane that we were putting our most intimate pictures? And I think one of the things that always astonishes me, I'm not on Facebook, um, one of the things that astonishes me is the way in which parents put their photos of, young, of, their, of their newborn on the network. 
Um, without ever thinking, well, th these people are going to grow up and they're going to see photos of themselves completely transparent all over the network. So I think it is a kind of, I wouldn't say a collective amnesia, but a collective kind of mania, maybe like the tulip mania of the 17th century, which we're beginning to wake up from. I think this latest Facebook crisis or this latest wave of Facebook crisis is forcing people to wake up. I also think... One of the, I think, one of the mistakes I think people always make about all this new technology is we always criticize the kids. We always say, well, it's the children's fault. They're the ones addicted to their smartphones. They're the ones who are putting all these photos up. They're the ones who don't get privacy. I actually think they are the ones who get this more than anyone else. I think it's the digital natives who are going to lead us out of this mess. They're the ones I've got. Uh, a 16 and a 20 year old, they wouldn't be seen dead on Facebook. It's old people now on Facebook. And I think that privacy will be rediscovered by digital natives in the, way, in the same way as young people now are rediscovering vinyl records. They're rediscovering paying for content. They're, de they're rediscovering the joy of handwriting. So I think privacy, which is a massive scarcity in the digital age, will become enormously valuable, and indeed for innovators and entrepreneurs, will be the source of great, of, of, of great fortune. Um, these models don't work. In, we always assume that when things work or when things are successful, they, they last forever. And again, as a historian, as someone, when you look back at the industrial age, when you look back at the American car industry, when you look back at the American food industry, you understand that when something is profoundly flawed, it breaks and is replaced by something else. And that's exactly what I think is going to happen with these networks, with these social networks. In 50 years, we'll look back and think, were, were these people mad? In the same way as we look back today in the middle of the 19th century and said, how could we have let 11-year-olds work in factories? How could have people lived in such squalor and such exploitation? I think we'll look back in the same way as, as that world today. Yep. Uh, Bradley Roberts, I'm uh, principal of one of the international schools uh, in Singapore, SJI International. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, the Waldorf School and the fact that uh, they are they have moved away from use of technology in schools. Um, France has just legislated that from um, August onwards, mobile phones will no longer be allowed in French schools because of all the mm. negative impacts that that's had on bullying and the impact of social media. I suppose I'm just trying to get, you know, I mean, other schools are trying to, I suppose, to educate children how to use these things more effectively. And I suppose I'm trying, from your side, you know, what do you think of things like a French move to to basically eradicate the use of mobile phones in schools and and whether and whether the the education on use of these things as opposed to the reduction through legislation I suppose is the way to go for schools going forward that's a really good question I you know I'm not I think the French in particular tend to be a little knee-jerk with technology um, so for example one, another of the tr French laws is they used to find, they used to require Google News to pay newspapers when they sent them customers, which was one of the most absurd reforms. So what Google News did was just shut down uh, in France, because why should they pay newspapers when they send them customers? Uh, I, I think that kind of overt regulation, hostility towards technology, <coughs> is extremely ill-advised. But I do think we have to acknowledge that we are teetering on the verge of a new kind of Luddism. And then unless we begin to clean up some of these aspects of technology, that mainstream hostility towards tech and big tech, and indeed towards innovation, is going to go mainstream. So we already have in the US, for example, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders on the left, and Ted Cruz and Steve Bannon on the right. Um, arguing in favor of antitrust and claiming that big tech and Silicon Valley is the problem with the American economy. Now, I, in some ways, I guess I agree with them. I wouldn't say that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, but we need to not change the laws, but change our cultural practices. When it comes to 
how people use cell phones. I think a better way of doing it is trying to reform from within. So in the book, I have a section on, for example, a group of concerned technologists within Silicon Valley, led by a guy called Tristan Harris, who is actively trying to get developers and software designers to sign Hippocratic oaths, promising, like a doctor, that they won't design software that is purposely addictive. One of the reasons why these kids can't control their use of tech, like with fast food or fizzy drinks, is because these things have been designed to be addictive. They've been designed to be bad for us. So I would like to see the reform coming from within Silicon Valley, from people like Tristan Harris, from a next generation, a new wave of developers who of course want to develop products and services and apps and platforms that people want to use and that have value, but aren't designed to be addictive. And I think it's in that environment that we can have um, uh, control of people's technology. I mean, when it comes to smoking, for example, you know, when you buy a packet of cigarettes, it comes with a warning that the, the, these things will kill you. Now, I'm not saying computers or smartphones should come with that. Uh, every time you switch it on, you know, if you use this more than 10 minutes, then, um, then you're, 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 you're destroying your social life or you're destroying your sanity. But it is interesting when you, you, you talked about Waldorf, is it is interesting that the tech guys get it. One of the most successful Waldorf schools in the US, indeed globally, is in Mountain View. It's the senior executives at Facebook and Google and Apple and Amazon who are sending their kids to these schools. Steve Jobs, who invented this device, you know, that changed the world more than anything else, he wouldn't let his kids use them. He wouldn't give his kids an iPad or an iPhone. So technologists get it, but it can't come from states banning it. Again, using my five tools. Parents have a responsibility, teachers have a responsibility, and kids have a responsibility. They need to control themselves. They need to learn self-discipline. Self-discipline and agency go together. But just banning it, in my view, is absurd, counterproductive, and ultimately will fetishize these things. Because we know when you ban something, like with the illicit drugs, it creates a massive underground market, crime, and a rampant obsession with this thing. So banning is a bad thing. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other question? I have another question uh, uh, for you that is uh, in your, when you were describing how the future is in trouble, yeah. um, one of the three, the, the three or four elements that you mentioned, uh, apart from inequality in jobs, was also the cultural uh, challenge, the cultural breakdown or, or yeah. whatever, right? Um, do you think that that can be solved with um, regulation, citizenship, etc.? I mean, I can see some of the um, sort of some some of the points that you made mm. easily applied to job inequality. Uh, sorry, job the disappearance of jobs, the income inequality, etc. But the cultural issue seems to me a much deeper problem. Uh. And you were also referring to. Um, sort of rising nationalism, the mm. nation state coming up, which is linked to that cultural um, isolation, I guess. Look, this conversation has been extremely civil. Everyone who has asked questions, they may not have agreed with me, they've asked it in a civil way. No one is insulting me, no one is insulting you. We're all respectful for one another. Why? Because we can all see each other. We all know that if we stood up and made some racist remark or some hateful remark or something that was just profoundly unconstructive and pointless, then we would be shamed, we would be embarrassed. And I think that's the problem still most of all with the digital revolution in terms of the cultural issues you talk about, is people behave irresponsibly because they can get away with it. They can be hateful towards women and minorities. They can be destructive. You know, Putin is, Putin is employing buildings full of people who are doing it. <coughs> buildings full of people who are pretending to be someone else in order to insult or, or, or incite hatred or undermine our, our, our most valuable institutions. So I think in this sense, 
the key is transparency. I think, and it comes back to the Estonian model. I think what the Estonians are trying to do, and, and maybe also in Singapore, the Smart Nation Initiative, <coughs> excuse me, is pioneering an, open, an openly transparent network, a platform, where you can't hide behind alien, aliases, where anonymity is impossible. In, in Estonia, you can't be anonymous online. You have to be accountable. We have to take responsibility in cultural terms. Now, we know that in a, in a problematic political environment, as in China, this is a catastrophe because in a dictatorship or in a totalitarian system where there is only one single truth and people are determined and their value entirely by how they relate to the government and what they say about the government, then it becomes Orwellian. But in an open political system, like in Estonia and perhaps in Singapore, then that accountability, that transparency can enrich culture because we're respectful towards people. So I think when it comes to culture, the biggest problem remains anonymity. Now, some people will say, well, you've got to have anonymity to be a whistleblower. You've got to have anonymity to protect people's privacy when you're saying things that are incredibly unpopular. Maybe that's true. But anonymity, I think, when it comes to the digital revolution and the cultural stuff you're talking about, that's the thing that soured our culture so much. That's the thing that's undermined truth. That's the thing that is festering hatred and racism and this, this terrible attack on, on women and minorities of every kind. So maybe again, and I have a chapter, and I'm not saying Estonia is the answer, and Estonia doesn't scale, of course, and Estonia has its unique historical circumstances which aren't necessarily replicable elsewhere. But I think what's happening in Estonia might be at least a guidepost for figuring some of this stuff mm. out. Chris. Hi, Chris from um, SFU. Um, mm. The sort of observation I have at the moment is around social media. Um, and it's really, it's, it's, it's trending now towards polarizing views. Mm. One of the ways it's doing that is through its algorithms, and that's inherent in the platforms. If you were a rightist-leaning individual, for example, you'd tend to be served more rightist-leaning content, and that gets ever more extremist. Yeah. Um, I'd like your views on, on what responsibilities you see um, um, for the social media platforms themselves, and, and, and what, what should be some of the recourses governments, I mean, you mentioned regulation as one of them, what recourses should governments have? Should, should civil society uh, have as well? Great question. Um, you know, and I think it's important to note that the kind of thing you're describing, the echo chamber nature of our culture, the lack of civility, the fact that people now have their own versions of the truth, which are entirely incompatible with the other side. It's not just an internet problem. You just got to switch on the television in the United States. You watch MSNBC and Fox, and they have entirely different versions of the universe, entirely different ways of interpreting, not, not even entirely different ways of interpreting facts, but entirely different facts. I mean, so, um, so it's not just an internet thing, but of course the internet is very much playing into that and is driving much of that. Uh, in terms of your question, I think the answer is very simple. These platforms need to be accountable as media companies. Now, in the, in the middle of the, the, the 1990s, the companies like Google and Facebook, uh, well, in, you know, in the late 90s, Google, with the Web 2.0 movement, sort of kind of discovered the holy grail in that they figured that they could become media companies without being accountable as media companies. So they could offer these platforms. Anyone could publish anything. They didn't have to pay for journalists. They didn't have to pay for editors. They didn't have to be accountable under the law because the American law passed this Safe Harbor Act as a way of trying to protect innovation and by saying that whatever gets published on these platforms, uh, these platforms aren't responsible for. But they are media companies. Facebook is a media company. Facebook allows us to publish anything we want on their platform, and they make money by selling advertising around that. 
Google is a media company. Google has aggregated our collective wisdom on the net. On, in 1997, 1998, the two founders of Google audaciously downloaded the entire internet onto Stanford University servers and figured out a way of collating that wisdom and producing a really brilliant search engine. But that's media. That's taking our content. And again, they have to be accountable. So I think the only way to solve this ongoing crisis is for these companies to recognize their media companies and to have the same accountability and the same responsibility. And ultimately, what they need to do is have editors. Just as newspapers and movie studios have editors, just as universities have professors and experts, so these, these platforms have to become accountable. And ultimately, the thing will only get solved when they recognize that. They are slowly but surely recognizing that. It's going to take a lot more work, and the law needs to change. So for example, this, this safe harbor law is a huge problem. They need to be as accountable under the law as anybody else. And, and, and the Germans, I think, are leading the pushback on this. The German laws about making these companies more accountable and finding them huge amounts of money when people publish lies and hatred on them is an extremely promise, promising development. I have, I have maybe a last question. Are you optimistic about that future? Will it be fixed? Do I look optimistic? <laughs> no, I am optimistic. I, you know, look, th these problems are enormous. I, I think I'm one of the small group of people who pointed out that a lot of the promises in Silicon Valley were just, they weren't true. They weren't, they weren't realistic, and a lot of them were just self. They were, a lot of them were the sort of the, the marketing, the, the clever marketing speak of companies that, 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 that were presenting themselves as improving the world and changing everything, but actually they were just making vast fortunes for their investors and technologists. I think things are changing. I think the zeitgeist has shifted. I think this latest Facebook example is really important. I think what the Europeans are doing in terms of uh, regulation, I think shifts in America, I think more and more focus on data privacy. I think recognition that our education system needs to profoundly change. I think more and more awareness that this technology is addictive. I think that all this stuff is beginning to come together. And we are taking a, a sort of a, a, a deep breath and thinking, OK, what's next? Now, I hope my book, How to Fix the Future, will offer a beginning, a kind of debate, a way of thinking about this stuff. None of this stuff is easy to fix. It's not going to be fixed in five or 10 years. You know, the, the jobless crisis, the impact of automation, the issue of data, the Chinese question which we brought up, all these questions are going to dominate the 21st century. But I believe in human beings. I believe in Moore's law. We've done it before, and we'll do it again. We did it in the Industrial Revolution. In the middle of the 19th century, who would have thought that we would have had social security systems to protect workers? Who would have thought that we would have laws that would stop 11-year-olds working in factories? Who would have thought we would have had laws that would have protected our cities from this rampant pollution? Who would have thought that we would have had laws making sure that products and food stuff weren't addictive and exploitative. It took generations. It took 50 or 100 years, but we did it. And I believe in us. I believe in our agency. I think as human beings, our secret source, our great value is fixing the future. We've done it before, and we'll do it again. Very good. Um, <coughs> it's always difficult to summarize in a discussion like this, but in, my, in this particular case, I can actually do it in uh, two very simple ways. I can either say the word agency, and that summarizes it. Or the other summary is, read his book. Uh, but I also got and a few. buy it as well. Uh, <laughs> we, it is in our library. Uh, um, we, uh, but I also uh, had a few sort of memorable quotes that I will be able to use that came up during the. Um, we all know that most, most predictions about the future get it always wrong. And this man is talking about the future, so what's the conclusion? Uh, did, he, did he get it wrong? 
secondly, we did discuss quite a lot about regulation, and I think I, to a large extent, agree that regulation is important, uh, but not a top type of top-down Orwellian type of regulation, but a regulation that is, uh, it is probably a good interaction between top-down, bottom-up, uh, acceptance of can, the can regulation. I just add one thing on yeah. that, which I didn't suggest, is that I think a lot of the innovation is going to come locally. I think that big government, central government regulation, particularly in the US, for example, is really just because the government's so paralyzed. So a lot of the innovation that's going to be coming from government will come from local government, from city government, and indeed from city states like Singapore. Yeah. No, I, the other one that I wrote down, Facebook could have been a CIA project. Um, <laughs> privacy is a massive scarcity, thus a source of great fortune. And I hope that some of the students here in the room may think about how can I make business about providing privacy. Um, the reform should come perhaps from within Silicon Valley. Uh, I also like the ideas that computers would, co would come with a warning. This is dangerous for your health. Uh, maybe we, that would be actually not a bad idea. But I do think uh, the reason why I mentioned some of these quotes is that uh, or the revival of the nation state, we all living in the global village, i.e. we live in a village that is globally connected. I think these, these statements reflect a number of uh, challenging ideas that we probably need to reflect upon, and that's precisely the point of this uh, presidential distinguished lecture series. It's not to bring another smooth speaker, but it is, and, and send us home, please, that we have it all right, but actually make us think about what uh, some of the challenges are uh, for the coming years and, and perhaps in this particular case uh, coming uh, 50 or 100 years. I'm a little bit less optimistic than Andrew in the sense that he says we made it happen in the 19th century. I would say over the last 10,000 years we made it happen once. Uh, maybe there was pure luck. But let's prove that statement wrong and let's make sure that we fix that future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andrew Keane and Professor DeMeyer. Professor DeMeyer will now present a token of appreciation to Mr. Keane. I'm presenting a book that is a summary of previous pre presidential distinguished lectures and Ho Rihua lectures. So with a bit of luck, maybe in the next edition you will be there. Well, I hope so. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's fine. Thank you. We have now come to the end of today's session. We hope you have found this session interesting and enlightening. We also would appreciate if you could take some time to complete the survey found in your program booklet. On behalf of Singapore Management University, I would like to thank all of you for coming here today. Thank you and have a great evening.